Howdy duty duty everybody. It's Christopher Palaha. You're joining me live for the Palaha Chautauqua on Oscar Sunday. It's very exciting. It is April 25th, 2021. Hey Colleen. Hello Shelly. Hello Gail. Hi Lisa. Hi Olivia. Hi Rhonda. Hi. Hey, hey, hey Seb. Hello Gail. Good evening to one and to all. Um, here's what I love about the Palaha Chautauqua community. It's Oscar Sunday and, um, and we still have a robust house. Almost instantly at 4.01 and climbing. Hey, the Mind Podcast. Um, guys, I have two friends who might win an Oscar tonight. Scott Hayes was in Minari. And that movie is up for an Oscar and for several different Oscars. And a girl I went to college with, a woman named Molly Asher, uh, produced No Man, No Man, La Nomad Land. Um, so it's exciting to think that peers, people that I, Molly, man, I've, that's 20 years ago, 20, 24 years ago at this point, 25 years ago. Um, it's a long time. So good luck to them. Good luck to everybody. We're gonna do a little bit of a hodgepodge because it's been such a wild week in the Palaha house, my household, but my the rest of my family is is safe somewhere else. I'm up, I've been in quarantine. I'm out officially. You would think that I'm sponsored by Fiji water. The way I've got those, those, <laughs> lick it, and I'm gonna like have my Fiji water. I'm not, but Fiji water. I've been to Fiji. Filmed a movie there called Pearl in Paradise. If you want to, uh, you know, talk, Fiji. Um, <clears throat> but let me get started, guys. Let me get started. I'm being a goofball. I got so much to share with you. Life can be scary and sometimes hard. When you've got a winning hand and you dealt the wrong card, it ain't fair. But you're not alone. Down and out, or high and dry, in the darkest valley, or the coldest night, you're fine, cause you're not alone. With a song bubbling in your heart, where a story could give you a brand new start. You don't have to travel this big bad world all on your own, now. Cause it's better when we do it together All mixed up and upside down Feels like there's no one else around That ain't right Well, you're not alone When it all goes south and life gets tough And you've been knocked down and the weeds are rough You just fight Cause you're not alone with a song bubbling in your soul Where a story can make you feel whole You don't have to travel this big bad world all on your own No, oh, it's better when we do it together Better when we do it together, right here on the Palaha Chautauqua. Um, ladies and gentlemen, such a joy to join you on this Sunday afternoon. What a beautiful Sunday. I've had so many thoughts this week about what I wanted to share with you and talk to you guys about. One of them, um, one of them is about how we are in the wake of other people's success. And I want you to ask yourself, are you a household that when you're young in or your brother or a sibling or someone calls you with really good news, are you a household that just celebrates them and lifts them up and makes them feel proud? Or are you a household that kind of all of a sudden gets a little uneasy at someone else's success and a little maybe jealous or a little like, be careful, don't put your neck out too far. Um, the reason why I ask is because I realized this week, um, in lieu of a lot of really cool things that have been going on, um, that when I call home, every time I call home, my mom and dad 
are so proud of me and my mom just wants to know every detail and asks the questions and my dad does this little like <laughs> like I can just tell he's proud and um and it's been that way my whole life and it's conditioned me to expect big things in life and I think that if if um and I hope that's what I'm doing. I know that Julianne and I are, are beyond um, beyond proud for our kids. And so that's just a reminder. I don't know why. It was a thought that I had this week, and I wanted to share it with you. I do want to talk about Grace. Um, Gail has done some extensive homework, and I'm going to bring her back on because I kind of I kind of uh, blindsided her last week and said, jump on and talk about Grace. And she was like, uh, okay. And so I gave her some time to prepare. In the meantime, I haven't had time to do any work. So I'm leaning entirely on, on Gail to help us out. I also, Lisa said that she has that clip. It has nothing to do with Grace. It has nothing to do with what I want to read to you. But I do want her to jump on. Lisa, if you're watching and you have your book, go ahead and grab it just in reference to if you happen to watch last week's and you want to finish the thought that we began. I do want to hear what, um, not Orson Welles, but George Orwell has to say about sort of, it's weird how prophetic it's become. Um, just how we've been so badgered and so beaten by the information that we're all kind of stepping back. And this is again a reminder that when you tune into the Palaha Shatakwa every Sunday, it's a reminder of what it means to be alive. And it started out as a reminder to what it means to be alive in the face of COVID and the death that that uh, was instigating. But as COVID is, is becoming more and more a part of our normal day-to-day -day life and as the, as the, as the uh, vaccines are more and more available, um, regardless of whether or not you think you should get a vaccine or not, there's just people who are getting vaccination and we're getting herd mentality for the, for the virus and, and COVID's just not gonna be as big a problem as it was a year ago. But people are still gonna die from all sorts of things because that's just the nature of our life and it's fleeting and, and it's temporary. And so this hour, as scary as death is, this hour is to serve as a reminder that while we're here, we gotta use our time. And I wanna read something that my parents sent me today um, because it's beautiful. But I do wanna finish the conversations that we started last week since this is a part two. So I'm gonna jump to Lisa and then I'm gonna jump to Gail and then I'm going to jump to this essay that my parents sent me that was written by Dr. Daniel McInnery, M-I-M-C-I-N-E-R-N-Y, McInnery, um, who teaches at, the, um, at Christendom College. Anyway, he wrote a really beautiful essay um, about the power of festivity in unfestive times. And I think it has a lot to do with a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Um, again, love this community, love your hearts. I love that you guys have found fellowship in the time of COVID through this. Uh, that makes me so happy. Um, oh, was it Carrie? Carrie, it was you, yeah? Carrie, were you the one that had the 1984? I believe so. I'm so sorry. I was calling you Lisa. Um, it is Carrie. Let's go to Carrie. <clears throat> Silly Christopher. Ooh, Carrie declined. Okay. Well, was it Lisa? This is what I love about the Palaha Chautauqua. It's catch as catch can. Yeah, not you. Okay. Well, then never mind. Don't, don't. Hi, it wasn't you. It wasn't me. No, I was like, what book are you talking about? You're like, what are you talking about? It was Carrie. And I completely okay. like, yeah, I've it's, been, I've been. That's juggling. all right. I'm like, last week was so last week. What were we talking about? You're like, do I know? All right. You know what? I'm still trying to figure out how to get rid of people. And I can't that's say right. goodbye. So it's you. I just do want to check in with you real quick. How are you, Lisa? Everything good? I'm doing good. I had a great day today. It's my son's 25th birthday today, so we're going to go out and celebrate a little bit. What's your son's name? His name is Zach. So Happy birthday, Zach. We have two sons. Happy Zach birthday, Zach. Zach. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we'll have fun. Enjoy the rest of the show. 
and um, it's good to see you. I will, will, I'll have you back on at some other point in time. No problem. You got lots of people to talk to. It looks right, like it's bye. Carrie Bow. All right. It is. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna hit. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I'm getting old. It's KP. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Um, all right. Let's do it again, shall we? All right, Carrie. I'm going to send a request to you now. Hi. There I am. Hey. Hi, Carrie. How are yeah, you? Yeah, sorry about that. Didn't mean to decline you. Oops. You declined me. You were like, no. Sorry. Not today. Not this Sunday, Palaha. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. That's right. So, Do you know the passage that I'm talking about? I don't. Okay. So, so in it, <laughs> that would have been see. very helpful for me to... to <laughs> to you and, and tell you so in the opening of the book he talks about Oceania and he talks about the news cycle and this promise of war overseas but but the population has been kept from actual battle so all it is is news of war is and I think it's right up front I want to say it's right up at the beginning like in the beginnings of the book and it talks about what he does for a living which is a race history yeah uh, I'm I'm in the first chapter. I'm looking. Hmm. Okay, so he starts off. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know where it is. Um, That's okay. Do you want me to go to Gail and you want to look for it while I while I talk to Gail? Is this okay? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. He's talking about. Let's see. He kept his back turned. It was. Yeah, I go to Gail, <laughs> and I'll look. So, okay. so you want to know, it's, it's when he's talking about his, his job, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's and, literally, he's talking about, it's this amazing passage, and maybe you want to Google it, because um, I can't remember where it is in the book. I'm so sorry. I should, have, I should have reached out to you and said, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Well, I should have asked. I sent you the passage. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. But, um, and I had a whole week. I could have found it myself. Um, but <laughs> it's, um, it is uh, the passage where he's talking about, the citizens of Oceania, and they keep hearing about war. So they're, they're, and they're exhausted. And what happens is you hear about this, this is, a, and, and it's talking about how this news of war just completely has exhausted this population. And everyone's just kind of like numb to the idea. Uh, if you can find it great, if not, then I'll, okay. I'll do some research and bring it up another time. Um, okay. It's I'll good look. to see you anyway, though. <laughs> okay, you too. All right, bye, Carrie. Bye. 1984. We're talking about 1984. Hey, hey, back girl. Um, guys, so I've got really good news. The reason I'm, I'm so peppy is um, on Friday, on Friday, I wrote my last chapter for book two of the From Kona with Love series. And Anna is on the home stretch and She's writing the last two chapters of the book, but don't tell anybody. Let's don't let her know. I, I let you know who's writing what. Um, but it um, it's really wonderful. I can't wait for you guys to read it. And I start work tomorrow, and so I've been doing all sorts of stuff. So I've been really really crazy this week, but I do wanted to I, I wanted to make time for you guys. So before I get to this thing that I want to read, I'm going to jump to Gail. Hi, Gail. <clears throat> Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, sister. How was your week? Um, good actually. I wasn't even here. I went to visit my aunt and my mother who I hadn't seen uh, you know, during COVID, so it was nice to finally be with them. They've been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated, so that's it was awesome. good to get together with family. So it was the first time you'd seen him in a year? Uh, first time I'd seen my aunt in a year. I had seen my mother one time, but that was it. And um, yeah, first time I saw my aunt. In fact, it was weird. She and I got together. We sort of met in the middle. We lived like four or five hours apart. And we got and we met in the middle one day. And it was like the very next week that COVID hit. I mean, we had, I mean, we would never have guessed that there would be that much distance between our visits. So crazy, right? Yeah, really crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been such a weird, 
it's so weird. I mean, I just spent 15 days in quarantine because of COVID. It's still like, it's yeah. still very much a problem. And, you know, everybody yeah. is still, I went outside for the first time today and it's just a different world. Everyone lives in, we yeah. live in a very different world. I, hopefully there's some normalcy that will resume. And, um, so last week we were talking about the idea of grace and you and I corresponded a few times throughout the course of the week. And you were like, we can go in any direction and this can we could do like a deep dive we could talk about mm -hmm. the concept of sin it can be a really like intensely um mm -hmm. almost about like the tenets of the christian faith kind of conversation for mature christians yep. or and then you said so how how where do you want me to go and i think mm -hmm. that the joy of the palaha chautauqua is that we have attracted people from all over the world who don't necessarily share in a Christian narrative, but who aren't opposed to hearing about it, and who are kind of who kind of dig hearing about that perspective, and mm -hmm. I and I would love it if you. I know that you were going to do a few little passages or, or whatnot, or I can read them if you mm -hmm. point me out to them or whatever you want me to do, um, but take ten or fifteen minutes or whatever you want, um, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to give you a chance because I know you've done some homework and I just wanted to give you a chance to, to complete the work that we started last week. So Gail, okay. take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, last week when we talked about grace, the first thing that I pointed out was that there was a difference between mercy and grace. You know, they're, they're cousins, but they, they go together, but they're not exactly the same. And, and, and it's important to distinguish between the two, because I think when you, especially when you receive them, you receive them for different reasons and you receive them in a different way. And to understand the difference helps you to um, understand the value of them. So remember from last week, I said mercy. When you give someone mercy, you're basically not giving them what they really deserve. For example, in college, uh, I took econ and I was horrible at it. I mean, absolutely horrible. And I just kept, I was failing on my tests, which was totally traumatic for me because I'd always been a really good student and I went to my professor and I said look I don't know what I'm doing I, I'm studying but I'm failing the test and he said you know I think you need to do x y and z to prepare for the test better and he said I just want to see improvement as the year goes as the semester goes on at the end of the semester so with each test I got better I got better I got better but the number grade that I had by the end of that class, I deserved an F. Even though I had improved, right. I deserved an F. But he didn't fail me. He didn't fail me. He showed mercy. Okay? Right. Yep. Now, so, so that was one thing I wanted to point out last week was there is a difference between mercy and grace. And so grace is in essence giving something to someone that they don't deserve, okay? He gave me a C. Mm. I didn't deserve a C, but he gave me a C because he saw how hard I had worked and he saw that I had progressed and he knew that I had the ability to do it. I had just struggled on the test. Right. So I wanted to make clear that distinction because sometimes they get lumped together and then they kind of lose their meaning, their distinct meaning. Yeah. Does that make absolutely. sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and so Does that make everybody out there listening, give me a little, give a little heart if that makes sense to everybody who's who's out there listening. Yeah, tell me because I I can't see the comments very well, so you guys will have to just yeah. bear with me. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. so talking about grace, and again, for anyone who's new to the Chautauqua, I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus, and so I do come at it from that Christian narrative. And the Bible is where I go to find out um, what God thinks about things. And, it, and I use it as a tool to guide me. And so one of my very favorite verses is in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So, so I've been saved. And it's God's grace. It's his gift to me that I've been saved because I believe in his son, Jesus. And when I was thinking about grace this week, I 
thought about something I had read in um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for those who don't know, was a famous German theologian. He ended up being killed by the Nazis. Um, my my father-in-law's favorite theologians. He talks about Bonhoeffer all the time. Oh, yeah. He's awesome. And that book, The Cost of Discipleship, is just a classic. But in it, um, Bonhoeffer talks about that grace, it's costly. It's costly. Um, It's freely given, but it's not free. Grace is freely given, but it's not free. And so let me just break that down for just a quick second. So for the giver, when you, when God gives us grace, it cost him something. It cost him his son, Jesus. That's what it cost him. When we as humans extend grace to someone else, it costs us something. It could cost us money. It could cost us time. It could cost us our own dreams. It could cost us our pride. When you extend grace to someone, it costs you something. And the reason I point that out is because then when you're a recipient of grace, you need to understand that it costs that person something. And and so for you to just neglect it or to just set it aside is disrespectful and it's painful. And really, the better way to accept grace is to allow it to then transform you. Grace is meant to be transformative. Does that make sense? That, to me, it does. Does that make sense to everybody <laughs> listening? I want to make sure people are... Back girls asked, does mercy cost anything then? Well, it certainly could. It certainly could. And that's why mercy and grace are so linked together. Mercy is kind of cost the person who needs mercy. Usually the cost of mercy is the thing that you've done that you need mercy for. Yes, the cost yes. Of grace isn't on you. It's on the person giving you grace. So I think right. the cost is on the other participant. Mercy, right. you know, the cost but, is already but, paid by her. Yeah. But when you receive grace, it's really important to um, acknowledge the cost of it. Because if you don't, you're really cheapening it. You're cheapening yeah. it. And that's one of the things Bonhoeffer talks about is um, when we either don't um, accept God's grace fully and what it means, then we're cheapening it for, for everybody. Or if we're receiving grace from another human being to not allow it to transform us, uh, then cheapens that gift. And it can be something simple. Like I'm even like throw out, uh, if you just want to walk away from the Christian era, even just something practical. You know, when you give someone a gift, you give someone a a birthday present or a Christmas gift. If they don't use it or they don't like it, there's a little sting, right? It's a little, yeah. It's like, well, uh, yeah, why why, you didn't like the gift I gave you? Yeah, it's funny. There's a ding. You have to get it, yeah. Right, exactly. And And so... I, well, I would just want to interject for one second. The idea, you keep saying transformation, and I want people to understand that in the Christian narrative, the mm-hmm. idea of transformation comes that when we accept the gift of Jesus Christ, and we accept mm-hmm. that he died for us, and we say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior, and I believe that you died on that cross for my sins, Right. We then get to put our sins at the foot of the cross, which Jesus mm-hmm. freely takes up, and the idea right. of transformation then becomes sanctification. And the whole concept yes. of being a Christian is being a little Christ. And our job then, while we're on earth, the minute we accept the narrative and believe it to be true, mm-hmm. then becomes a transformation towards a Christ-like life where we start to reflect who Jesus was through our words and through our actions. And that's the transformation that you're speaking of. And exactly. the first step of that is grace. The first step of that is accepting the gift. That's right. God makes the first step in extending that grace, and then you receive it. And and God will meet you wherever you are. You know, I said last week, I don't care what you have done, how bad you think you are, God will forgive you if you come to him and you ask for his forgiveness. And so, 
you know, to, to be able to, to bring that to God and lay it at his feet, he will accept you wherever you are. But here's yeah. the catch. He doesn't expect you to stay there. Right. Well, is He's it repentance? Say- it's, r- repentance is twofold. It's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it also means to repent literally means to turn around. It does. Greek, it means to turn. The Latin is great. It means to turn. So you're turning away from the behavior that was causing you to stumble in the first place. And when I think, and I think, again, I want to break it down for both people, like both, both sides of the, of the camp. For the Christians mm-hmm. who sin is a common like vocabulary and we understand the concept of it, or sometimes mm-hmm. even as Christians, we misunderstand it. And for everybody else who hears the word sin and thinks it's the big bad mm-hmm. boogeyman, mm-hmm. sin is, is missing the mark, is missing. We are designed. See, I believe that we are designed by a loving God to be a very best version of ourselves. And that mm-hmm. is to be a vessel of love. That mm-hmm. is to be a vessel of encouragement. Like mm-hmm. all of us, every single human being on the planet, Jesus showed us how to be that way. He was the best example in the history of mankind on how to be a perfect human being. And our job right. is to emulate that. And when right. we fall short of that, that's what a sin is. So anything, and what happens with sin is it's a foothold, right? So mm-hmm. like one little tiny sin starts to gather guilt and starts to gather shame and starts to gather, and yeah. it starts to snowball and before yeah. you know it, you're breaking relationships with people and you're, you're yeah. and especially that relationship between you and God. I think that's where, and ultimately sin is death. And, yeah. and, it, and it can be the death through the form of addiction or death through the form of, you know, where you just have, you've gotten yourself so far away from everyone that you're just in danger. You're in a dangerous place in your life. And right. you're hanging out with dangerous people who are also separated because of sin. Yeah from healthy relationships and from ultimately that loving relationship between our maker and us right. versus life. And when Jesus says, I am the life, That's right. there's something so powerful because all of a sudden, and again, I've talked to, I've used this metaphor a lot. Jesus is like this light that shines into dark places and sin mm-hmm. is like a mold. And when you open up mm-hmm. that cellar door and let that light in, it dries up all the mold and all of a sudden you're able to sweep through and go, okay, now I can, So there's a difference between, there's different stages of sanctification. The first stage is getting out of sin and dealing with all your bondage and getting rid of all of the things that are holding you back and keeping you separated. Mm -hmm. And then there's the sanctification towards holiness and towards, and so that's, that's the journey as a Christian. And you were saying, and the reason why I'm saying this is because you said God will meet you where you are. And so it isn't about us doing the work of cleaning up. It isn't about like, well, I'm not good enough yet. I got to get my house clean before Jesus comes into it. Or my heart ready before he can, before I can give it to him. He'll take you as you are just right now. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He, he looks for a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's what he's looking for. And if you can bring him your broken, even if that's all you have to offer him, that's enough. He wants that. And he will come in and he will transform you. But, you know, getting back to the whole grace thing. So he extends his grace. He, he's given up his son for, for everyone, to anyone who believes. And yet some people will say, well, hey, if I'm safe now and God's grace is going to cover me, I can just go back and to what I was doing before, because, hey, he'll forgive me and he'll cover me with his grace. It did doesn't you, exactly did you, work that way. Yeah. Did you did you read about that cult back in the day, the Greeks, when Paul came and, talk, and talked about Christianity and there was a group of, a sect of Greeks who were like, this grace thing is awesome. So the more we sin, the more we're right. called, like, we're, the more we're going to have grace rain down on us. And so it was literally about these, these group of people that were like living so wildly because they wanted yes. to go and be like, I'm so sorry, God, give me your grace. Right. And it ain't that. Right. it's not that. <laughs> it's not that. It's not that. And that's what I mean by cheapening the grace. If you don't allow it to transform you, you know, you, you ask God to forgive you of whatever it is that separated you, you from him and you repent, meaning you say, I'm going to turn away from that now. Then, yeah, we're all human. We're all going to slip up. And the grace is for those moments when we do slip up. But when you purposefully continue walking in that sin, thinking, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just get the grace later. It'll cover it. It's fine. Then you really didn't change your heart. You know, it's funny. This verse has popped out at me twice this week. It said, if you do the thing you know you're not supposed to do, then it's a mm-hmm. sin. 
Like yeah. if you know it's not right and you still choose to do it, even though you're like, eh, it's, it's not right. You, you've said, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, I think that goes to the, to the topic of we as humans, we've tended to um, give sin different layers, right? Uh, murder is, is a bigger sin than a lie. Or, you know, something like that. Like when you look at a graph, you know, you have a bar graph, certain bars go up higher than others. That's how we see right. sin. But God sees it from up above. They're all the same exact square. Little dots, <laughs> little dots all the way across. I love that. Exactly. You know my, son, my son and I, we were talking, uh, my older boys and I were in the hot tub and we were discussing like, well, is this worse than that? And all of a sudden we were like, no, they're all like, it, it's all, it's all the worst. Like it, there is no yeah. great sin that's going to really cast you down to hell in the deepest of pits. It's all, you know, and I think that sin, and here's, yeah. here's where, I, here's where I venture outside of conventional thinking. I think that the practice of sin, it hardens the heart so that when you die, you're just, you don't want God because you've spent your whole life rejecting God. So you're not mm -hmm. gonna be with God, which would then be hell. Because in that moment, you're gonna know that there is this thing that is so wonderful and loves you so intensely that we can't even fathom. So my brother-in-law in, in the wake of his father's death and Julianne's daddy's death has mm -hmm. really done a deep dive in near-death experiences. And I don't know if you've, done any work looking up in, into that stuff but people mm -hmm. from across the spectrum christians but then atheists neurologists like like neurologists sorry brain doctors like dudes who whose job it is to go into the brain and study it and know it and do surgery on it uh to um mostly analytical thinkers mostly these people in the science field will have near-death experiences and all mm -hmm. of them account they recount the same event happening there is a jesus figure who's in the light mm -hmm. who calls them mm -hmm. and they have this choice to walk towards the light or to mm -hmm. be stuck in this weird blackness that's away from it and mm -hmm. i'm worried for people i think when you say well am i going to hell if i don't it's not about like accept jesus or your it's almost like the only way in is if you know the way in it's a passcode you've got to be able to get in and in order to get your heart ready for that choice you've got to know the choice that you're going to make and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's where I think sin comes into play in the in this, because I don't know we don't know what's going to happen next, but mm -hmm. but we know there's a twofold thing to this book and to what it teaches the wisdom. One is the promise of what is to come, which is everlasting and is this beautiful paradise that we can't fathom, and the other yeah. one is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and there is a chance to make this life beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. And to, Absolutely. And to make this life beautiful. Um, yes. All right. I'm going to let you, I'm going to, you, you're amazing, Gail. You were a lifeline to me today. I'm, I've, I'm sorry. I used you as a crutch. I was like, Gail will do it. Okay. <laughs> and I'm so glad I did because the Lord oh. used you in such a powerful way just now. Do you have anything you want to close with? I feel like I don't want to cut you down before your, before your time, but do you, I, I just want to encourage. I just want to encourage people if they have questions about grace or they have questions about God, you know, ask, ask those questions. God's God's got big, big, broad shoulders. He can handle your questions. He can handle your doubts and your fears. Um, you know, find someone uh, to talk to, but don't give up the search um, because what you think about God is really the most important. The question you answer about God, whether he's real or not, that's the most important question you're ever going to answer. And like you were saying, we don't know the exact um, steps of what's going to happen in death. We have some some things referred to in scripture, but, but, you know, we don't have all the exact steps. But you're right. If you have accepted God, if you accepted what he said and he said to accept Jesus, then you're going to go to that eternal life with him. He's going to give you what you asked for. So if you rejected his gift of grace, he's going to give you what you asked for. You asked for no thanks. So you're going to get no thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I just, my heart um, is just wanting everyone. And that was God's heart, right? That everyone should be saved. He didn't want anyone to perish. Right. And, and to some perish. people say, well, you know, Jesus, he had such an exclusive um, statement that he was the only way to God. Well, scripture says that that is what he said. It was very exclusive. But here's the kicker. It was the most inclusive offer ever made. It said, whosoever believeth in him will not perish. That means it doesn't matter if you're what your gender is, where you're from, how much money you got. It doesn't matter. It does it not matter. None of, it, nothing, nothing matters. None of that matters. Anyone, anyone can find relationship again, restored relationship again with God. Anyone. They just have to want to. So I hope this I encourages. Warning. I got my warning that my my battery's about to die again. Can you imagine? Have you not learned your lesson about I, getting I your phone charged? I need grace before the Chautauqua, huh? Have you not learned your lesson of getting your battery charged? I've got my battery plugged in. Problem solved. Um, that was beautiful. <laughs> that was a hundred percent beautiful. And I also it made me think that when when everyone says, "Well, that's such an." exclusive you know that jesus is so exclusive i also look at the people that he inter interacted with during his time on this planet and it wasn't the elite and it wasn't the beautiful powerful it was the ones who were on the outskirts the outcasts the woman at the well who was frankly an untouchable um zachariah the tax collector or zekiai or whatever zekiai the tax collector who uh it was these people that no one else wanted to deal with. That's and I right. think that anybody who's watching who feels unworthy of God's love like that needs to just read a few. And that's the thing about the Bible. It's so powerful that when you start reading it, that's yeah. the thing. I don't care what, what, what walk you're walking. It's mm -hmm. such an amazing source of wisdom and life and love that no matter who you are, if you start reading the word, it has this effect. It just starts yeah. to penetrate your life from your mind to your heart, into mm -hmm. your spirit, your soul, and you become mm -hmm. transformed. Absolutely. And, and scripture it. even and says that. Yeah. Scripture says that, that it's a, it's the sword and it, it can even divide uh, marrow and bone. It goes down as deep as you exist. So, and you know, if there's folks out there who are like, you know, I tried to read the Bible. I just, I couldn't get through it or whatever. First of all, there's tons of translations and you always use the message, yeah, which is a wonderful message. translation for folks, right? But there's a show out there right now called The Chosen. I don't know if yeah. you've watched it or not. Love that show. It's on YouTube. Go watch The Chosen. It'll give you an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about Jesus. Yes, they took a few liberties because it's a TV show, but at the heart of it, they really did a good job of staying close to Scripture. So even if that is your doorway in, let that be your doorway in. And it, and it shows it from the disciples' point of view, which is kind of an amazing. These, who, who people yeah. like you and me who are just broke yeah. down. Like, and that's the thing. We're all broken. We all have a whole list of stuff we could slab on the table and be like, well, I did this and this and I said this and I thought this and blah. We could all right. and have volumes of, of stuff that would keep us away from healthy relationships. But at the same mm -hmm. time, that's where the renewing power of Jesus comes in. And he says that. And to me, it's one of the favorite, my favorite things that Jesus says, I will make all things new. Yes. And that's this beautiful this promise of renewal and regrowth. When people say, oh, I'm born again. So well, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? You sound like some kind of weirdo. It's like, no, I'm literally, I'm a new creation. Like I, I was one way and then I met Jesus and I'm another way. Yes. And nary the twain shall meet. And I love that God says, I separate you from your sins as far as from the East is from the West. And it's just like, and I don't remember them. Right. And so the grace that he pours on us is so unfathomable. Yes. And when you watch the passion, you understand the cost. Yes. Because it was real. And I learned this year, and I think I said this on the Chautauqua, the struggle for Jesus to even make it to the cross mm -hmm. was real. Because yes. he could have died in the flogging. He could have died on the way to, to Calvary. He mm -hmm. could have died at any moment in the Garden mm -hmm. of Gethsemane, and the story would have been totally different. 
but he got Jesus. onto the cross and that was right. a, that in and of itself was a victory for him to get mounted onto that plaque of wood. Yes, it was. I, I did a teaching this year for my Bible study all about that specific time frame of the crucifixion all the way through to his death and how scripture is very explicit in saying he chose the moment to die. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't. kill him. He, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He didn't die and then his head slipped over. He bowed yeah. down in reverence to God and gave up his spirit. And if you think about it, his life was in jeopardy. His human life was in jeopardy from the moment he was born because Herod wanted to have him killed. I mean, yeah. there were so many places along the well, way. When he was born, when he was born, all the babies were killed. When he was born. I know. It was a definite life from day one. You know, mm -hmm. I, this, is a, this is food for thought. When Jesus hung his head and said, Lord, why have you forsaken me? I don't want your answer now. I just want everyone to think about it. Was in that moment Jesus genuinely feeling forsaken? Did he feel a separation from God? Or is it just him quoting Isaiah? And was he just he quoting, quoting scripture? I want everyone to think about that. You can answer another time. Um, okay. I'm going to let you go, Gail, because I want to read this thing. It's going to take me about 10 minutes. Okay. And you got to just rock and roll in your gifts today. And I'm so glad that I did. I, I, that, that was the Holy Spirit working and it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. Um, My thanks for giving so me the opportunity. I love that you were able to use this platform today and you rock and roll it, Gail. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Now, I'm, hang up on you. I'm gonna hang up on you. I, gotta, I guess what I have to do is, um, bye Gail. I guess what bye. I have to do is, um, I guess I have to sign, I have to drop I have to get rid of my, um, I have to get rid of my Instagram account app and then redo it. I don't know. Who knows? Guys, instead of the fashion on the red carpet, we're talking about, we're talking about Jesus, which is kind of fun. I'm going to read you guys something very quickly. It's called Principles. Here, I want to make sure I'm not too turned away from you guys. Um, <clears throat> Oh my gosh, Carrie. Oh, Carrie. Carrie, next week, I promise, and we'll talk in the between. I'll make sure we have the right thing. You're so awesome. And I love your, it's like a game we're going to play. It's a three week, it's a three parter. Um, this is called Principles from Christendom College The Power of Festivity in Unfestive Times by Daniel McInery. You were very brave to sit down and read a piece by a philosopher on the theme of festivity. We philosophers do not exactly have a reputation for spreading joy and the festive spirit. We can in fact be rather dull at parties, especially when we start quoting our favorite German philosophers. I should say when we get invited to parties. A friend of Dr. Johnson, the 18th century British poet and essayist, once told him that he had done his best to become a philosopher, but cheerfulness kept breaking through. Well, in this article, I will do my best to play against the type and remain cheerful as I share with you some thoughts about festivity and its surprising power to evangelize the culture. First, let's be clear on what we mean by festivity. We think we know what festivity is, don't we? It's the Christmas party, the birthday party, the Friday happy hour, the special family dinner when the kids are home. But we need to be careful. Genuine festivity may play a part in such activities, but then again, it may not. A special family dinner may, depending on the circumstances, be downright unfestive. And I don't just mean when Uncle Fred starts tippling. What I mean is the appearance of people having a good time, smiles. Hang on, page turn. Laughter, conversation, music, plenty of good food and drink does not guarantee that genuine festivity is occurring. Genuine festivity springs from a source deeper and more mysterious than any of these appearances. It is a source that can give us far more than a warm and pleasant feeling. It has the power, in fact, to restore all things in Christ. In order to uncover the secret of true festivity, I want to begin with a winter's tale. Actually, the winter's tale. Shakespeare's late comedy performed first in 1611. The inciting incident of the play occurs when Leonidas, Leon, Leon, Leonori, ah, Leonoris, Leonidas, anyway, Leonites, king of Sicilia, accuses his pregnant queen, 
harmony of adultery with no questionable cause whatsoever. whatsoever. Leonetis, Leo, Leonites suspects that the child Harmony is carrying his offspring of Harmony's illicit affair with Leonetis' oldest and best friend, Polynixes, the king of Bohemia. Leonetis imprisons Harmony and therefore shortly after giving birth to a daughter, Perdita, the lost one, Hermione dies heartbroken. Leonetis the, uh, then orders one of his retainers to take the infant uh, Perdita into exile. My gosh, the names. Come on, Shakespeare. At, uh, at Christendom, one of the philosophy electives I teach is ethics and imagination. In this course, we reflect upon how the imagery of creative works of literature shows us, rather than tells us, what it means to live an ethically good life. In the spirit of this course, I want to offer King Leonides' irrationality at the beginning of The Winter's Tale as an image of a political uh, community in fear, confusion, and turmoil. In other words, take Leo as an image of the way we live now with so many of our schools and businesses clamped shut, with so many facing fearing rampant spread of COVID-19, with our houses of worship battling to keep their doors open with scandal and division in the body of Christ itself. As in Leo's Cecilia, the goodness, truth, and beauty Hermone represents today have been cruelly served, leaving us all in the position of Perdita, like little lost ones in exile. But this isn't the end of the story of King Leo. In fact, in the final act of the play, Leo is invited by the grave and good Paulina, his deceased queen's devoted lady-in-waiting, to come to her home in order to see a newly made statue. Sixteen years have passed since Leo irrationally since Leo's irrational tirade against his wife. And in those 16 years, he has done much to atone for his sin. As Paulina acknowledges in Act 5, Sir, you have done enough and have performed a saint-like sorrow. No fault could you make, which you have not redeemed, indeed paid down more penitence than done trespass. Leo's patience opens the way for genuine festivity. His 16 years of mortification clear away the weeds and brambles that have covered the mysterious wellspring of true joy. Indeed, the waters from that spring have begun to refresh the world once again. The lost Perdita has recently been found in Polynixie's Bohemia of all places where she has fallen in love and promised to marry Polynixie's son, Florizel, now returned to Sicily, with uh, she is reunited with her father, while Leo is reconciled with uh, Polynixes. However, the greatest part of the family's festive reconciliation is still to come. When the family arrives at Paulina's house to see the statue, they are taken by uh, they are taken by her into a gallery, which is also referred to as her chapel. There, the statue awaits them, covered by a sheet. When Paulina removes the sheet, the onlookers behold a wonderfully lifelike image of Harimony. 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 So wonderful that the statue even shows the wrinkles brought on by the intervening 16 years. As Leo gazes awestruck at the statue of his wife, Paulina declares that she has a further surprise, and before she reveals it, she warns them, it is required you do awake your faith. Paulina then bids the statue of Hermione to come down from the pedestal and to the amazement of all, the statue obeys, descend, uh, descends from the pedestal alive and well, and husband and wife, mother and daughter, two estranged friends and their children, two estranged kingdoms are reunited with the deepest, most satisfying joy. Shakespeare is cagey as to whether Hermione has indeed miraculously come back to life or whether Paulina and Hermione have contrived to keep Hermione safe and hidden all these years. The evidence of the play pretty clearly points to the latter alternative, but even if Hermione is not miraculously resurrected, the power of the image remains the same. What Shakespeare is showing us is Hermione's resurrection is an image of perfect festivity. 
Notice it isn't the image of a party. No doubt a festive, a feast to celebrate the various reunions will surely follow later that day. And presumably the celebration of Perdita and Florenzel's wedding will soon follow as well. But these celebrations are not themselves the heart of festivity. Important as they are, they are only the physical form of the invisible spring that is the true festive spirit. Take another look at the image Shakespeare offers us. Remember that the statue is kept by Paulina in her chapel. At the moment of revelation, Paulina instructs Leo and the rest to awaken their faith. When the statue is uncovered, both Leo and Perdita kneel before it as if in adoration, as if the statue were a monstrance. But after Hermione descends and Paulina directs the overwhelmed Leo to take Hermione's hand, Leo does so explaining, oh, she is warm. If this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. Leo wants the transubstantiation contrived by Paulina to be as lawful as eating. Just as in the new law of the gospel, we consume the crucified cross, come back to life. When Shakespeare offers us at the climax of the winner's tale is an image of the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist but the greatest of feasts? and what power this feasting has. It has the power to quell fear, confusion, and turmoil. It has the power to quicken mercy and freshen love, to reconcile friends and spouses, parents and children, even whole kingdoms. The Eucharist has the power to change hearts, to change the world. But you know that already. You already know well, you are already well aware of what Pope John Paul II taught us, the Eucharist is the source and the summit of all evangelism, evangelization. This is clearly a Catholic uh, periodical. However, I want to illuminate how the spirit of true festivity that we find in its highest form in the Eucharist feast has the power to evangelize culture in contexts outside the Mass and Eucharistic adoration. In order to see how this is so, we need to be even more precise about what we mean by festivity. When we know that whatever it is, we find it in highest form in the Eucharist. But what exactly is it that we find there? The 20th century German philosopher, Joseph Piper, an author we love well here at Christendom, and one of those we love to quote at parties, gives us the secret in his beautiful little book, In Tune with the World. He says, and he quotes, Festivity is essentially a beholding, a contemplation, a loving and grateful affirmation of the goodness of all creation. It is saying yes to all that God has made. Isn't this just what we do when we celebrate, for example, a child's birthday, the cake, the candles, the presents, the games, these are only the physical manifestations of that internal and invisible amen to the life of the child. Why else would we celebrate someone's birthday except to say, in effect, I am so thankful you were born. I am so thankful you were part of God's creation. And I thank God that I have this opportunity to behold you, to contemplate your wonders and give praise to God for what he has made. This loving, grateful beholding is the true and invisible festive spirit. This is what we are really thirsting for when we attend the Friday happy hour or toast a young couple at their wedding reception. We simply are trying to see all that is truly good in this world. Not do anything with it, but simply look at it. Gape at it. Turn it over lovingly in our hearts, in our minds and thanksgiving for it. A party isn't actually necessary for festivity, though it is, surely is nice. But oftentimes festivity occurs in silence when, for example, a couple married for many years sits together, neither saying nor doing anything in particular, drinking up all that is good about one another, their children and their grandchildren, to their entire life together with all its joys and sorrows. What are they doing but proclaiming a silent and grateful yes. We can see better now how the appearances of festivity, its physical form in the happy hour, concert, or celebratory dinner can actually mask an unfestive spirit. 
In fact, partying can be a symptom of tremendous sadness. Piper identifies such sadness with the age-old vice of acidia, often translated as sloth. Sloth is not laziness, it is as, as it is often thought. It is rather a refusal to say yes to the goodness of all creation. Sloth is the refusal to say yes to the goodness of all creation. Many seek festivity unfestively. While they may recognize certain things like pleasure, wealth, and honor as goods, they refuse to recognize the whole of creation and above all, the author of all that creation as good. They view the world as a fundamentally hostile place in which the best one can do is take one's comforts as one can. Piper points out, interestingly, that Asadia is a violation of the third commandment to keep holy the Lord's day. For what is the Lord's day but the day on which we take, a, take it leisure in order to contemplate gratefully the goodness of all that is? Today is that day, kids. Especially in that Eucharist, that thanksgiving that Christ renders to the Father on our behalf in the holy sacrifice of Mass. Okay, we're at the home stretch here. True festivity, Piper argues, is culture at its highest fulfillment. This means that when it comes to evangelizing, evangelizing, evangelizing present day culture, our chief task is to attract the culture to the delights of the festive spirit. The culture we live in should most accurately be deemed an anti-culture because it is so adamantly and sadly refuses to say yes to the goodness of all that is. So how are we to attract our anti-culture to festivity? I would like briefly to suggest three ways. First, we must cultivate festivity in ourselves, above all in our own devotion to the Eucharist, but also by cultivating a contemplative spirit for the working day. For this, we need to stand guard carefully over our attention, especially during this pandemic and our being more beholden than ever to digital technology. It comes to light that attention, our attention is one of our greatest treasures as human beings. And one of the things the anti-culture most wants to take from us as we learn from the disturbing Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, the big tech companies, especially social media companies, are working hard to manipulate our attention. Our attention is what they are selling to their advertisers, and they control our attention precisely by offering us sham versions of festivity. We don't need to be a Luddite about technology, but most of us need to be much more intentional about guarding our attention not only from onslaughts by social media, but also from the incessant sensationalism of the news and the often impoverished offerings of popular entertainment. On the first Sunday of Advent, our Lord urges us in St. Mark's Gospel, be watchful, be alert. May he not come suddenly and find you sleeping. With our attention secured, we have spiritual space open for prayer, certainly, but also for cultivating a 24-7 sense of gratitude and a loving beholding of all the gifts God has given us. Such contemplation must necessarily produce joy, which, as Bishop Robert Barron likes to teach, is our most attractive quality when it comes to evangelization. This contemplative joy, however, seeks an outlet, some physical form. This is where the parties and celebrations come in. It is also where poetry comes in, and indeed, all the arts. A second key way we can attract the anti-culture to festivity, therefore, is by the cultivation of beauty, especially in the arts. Referring to another point Bishop Barron likes to make, when appeals to truth and moral goodness fail to be heeded by those without the disposition to hear them, the attractiveness and apparent harmlessness of beauty remains persuasive. Here, too, the winner's tale serves as guiding image, even before Hermione is brought back to life. She exists in her beholder's eyes as a beautiful work of art. Indeed, Leo is so taken by the beauty of what he thinks is the statue of his wife that he wants to act as if the statue were alive. Still, methinks there is an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. The fine arts have this power, if I may, this kind of Eucharistic power to change us and inspire us to offer that precise, that, to offer us that praise of the world that is the essence of festivity. 
the fine arts plant in us seeds of the world. Sorry, the fine arts plant in us seeds of the word and thereby prepare us for the power of the ultimate Eucharist. We see this connection be between contemplation and the fine arts in the etym etymology of the word we use for the very Shakespeare practice, the art of the theater. The English word theater is derived from the ancient Greek verb theorion, which literally means to gaze upon. In ancient Greek theaters, the arena or the area where the audience sat and gazed upon the play was called the theatron, the gazing place. For the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, contemplation, the highest and best of all man's virtuous activities, is named by another version of the verb theorian, theoria. Thus, from ancient times, the art of the theater has been linked to that loving seeing that is contemplation. This is what the theater is, the place where we go festively to contemplate the goodness of the human condition whether it's comic or it's tragic dimension. And this is what our practice of all the fine arts must be if we are to combat our unfestive anti-culture. Of course, the fine arts are not the only arts of festive contemplation. The practice of the liberal arts, our calling here at Christendom College is another form of festivity our culture very badly needs. So too are those smaller acts of loving attention that we find in activities is seemingly disparate as a dinner party in which good manners and conversation are deliberately practiced. A praise-filled walk through nature on a gorgeous day and a celebration even in the sharing of an article such as this. Ha, it's written. Where minds come together to contemplate the highest and the best things. Guys, that is what we do here on the Palaha Chautauqua. We come together to contemplate the highest and the best things, to gaze at the beauty of a world that was made by a loving God who loves you. I remember when I was a boy growing up in the Catholic church, every Sunday I would take communion and my prayer was, Lord, as your body is dissolved and digested by my body, let your cells become my cells. Change me on a cellular level. So I pray that for you guys. Lord Jesus, I lift up this Palaha Chautauqua community. I pray that they will this week discover the beauty of the world that is around them. That they will not walk in fear. That they won't live in panic. That they will not be afraid, but that they will see your glorious creation. And that they will begin to reflect your life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, dudes. You guys have an amazing week. I appreciate you and your patronage of this community. Um, if you want a hat or a t-shirt, the store is open. It's going to be open for a couple more weeks. And uh, I hope everybody has a really, really great week. I'll see you next Sunday.